Hi, folks. Yes, as Chris said, I'm my name's Steve Hill. I'm the Chief Scientist at Geoscience Australia. To um, start us off, I'd first of all like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. And I think it's exciting to think that that land extends over a lot of different places with people all um, calling in. I'm currently in Adelaide and I'm on um, Ghana country over here. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in the seminar today. Um, okay, let's have a look at our talk today. Everybody I speak to tells me how much they love David Hazelhurst and how he's a great person and a great thinker. So I'm really excited to hear about this and, and um, maybe also fall in love as well. Um, a little bit of the background on David is that um, he's the Deputy Secretary at Agricultural Trade Group in the Department of Agriculture, Water and Environment. In this role, he supports farmers, food processors um, and exporters to sustainably grow their businesses through access to overseas markets and regulatory services to meet the requirements of trading partners. Prior to this, David was the Deputy CEO of Business Partnerships and Support at Austrade, responsible for strategy and business transformation, partnerships, digital and IT and corporate and ministerial services. As a Deputy Secretary in the Industry Innovation and Science Portfolio, David led Oz Industry, the delivery hub for Australian government services to business, digital strategy and operations, and implementation of the government's national innovation and science agenda. Previously, David's also held senior appointments in four other portfolios. He's led teams advising prime ministers on economic and industry policy, federal budgets, and the Council of Australian Governments. He also drove initial implementation of the Australian government's digital transformation agenda and was interim CEO of the Digital Transformation Office. As well as all of that, David holds bachelor degrees in economics and law and a master's of public policy from the Australian National University. He's a member of the Council of the Institute of Public Administration, ACT division. Okay, let's now hear from David. Please make him feel welcome. Over to you, David. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, and uh, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak to you today um, on a topic that's um, uh, quite close to my heart. Um, uh, in, it's all about agile. Um, I, uh, I must start at the outset by also uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm uh, sitting today, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders, uh, past, present and emerging. Um, and I should also start with a bit of a, a health warning um, or a disclaimer. Um, of course, uh, I don't profess to know all of the uh, detail uh, or have a detailed understanding of the operations of Geoscience Australia. I'm broadly familiar with what you do, um, but I'm conscious that some of my um, experiences and my remarks today are a bit contextual and You'll, you'll need to also think about the extent to which they're applicable um, in your environment. Um, but I do know a lot about uh, public policy um, and service delivery, uh, and in particular, um, problem solving, uh, and particularly in relation to delivering uh, great outcomes for um, the people that we serve. Um, and so a lot of my reflections are kind of built uh, around that. Um, and uh, I understand uh, from the, um, the flyer uh, for my session um, that there was a reference to an epiphany that I had. So I thought I might speak briefly about that epiphany um, and then um, 
speak a little further then about the experiences and the insights that have gathered since that epiphany um, and then potentially really just open it up to questions and, and discussion um, because I suspect you'll have a lot of questions about what does this all really mean in practice and, and, and how uh, can you use an agile mindset um, to change the way in which it feels to work and achieve the things you want to achieve in the organisation that you're in. So a little bit of a story then, a little bit, uh, you've already heard quite a lot about me and thank you for that introduction, Steve. But um, the story I want to tell is really one of a, um, a career bureaucrat uh, who um, was really very much what I describe um, as a sort of serious uh, policy wonk. Um, that really described me. Um, up until an opportunity I got uh, to be involved in the setup of the Digital Transformation Office um, several years ago. And that, that's the office that's now referred to as the Digital Transformation Agency. Um, but up until that time, I'd worked across a whole range of policy uh, areas and delivery areas um, in the APS. Um, uh, very much as a, as a, as a, as I say, a policy wonk, someone who thought that they had a very good handle on um, serious approaches to policy development, um, very strong focus on uh, economic analysis in particular, um, and very much a focus on um, great big strategies uh, that would, uh, you know, transform um, uh, different areas of the economy or society based on the policy analysis that we'd undertaken. And I got this opportunity to work on the setup of the Digital Transformation Office, which uh, really changed my worldview on things. Um, I, came, it, I came into it uh, having worked on the um, policy development for the government's digital transformation agenda, but they needed someone ahead of the recruitment of the permanent CEO to be involved in just setting up the office. And it started as a startup effectively in a derelict building in the middle of Canberra. And uh, I was surrounded initially only by six people, uh, but then it grew to being about a hundred of people who were very passionate uh, about digital transformation in particular, and very familiar um, with uh, concepts relating to agile um, and human-centered design. Oh gosh, am I still online, Steve? You're still online. Ah, okay. Sorry, the camera angles changed on me. Um, and uh, the the thing that was really interesting to me about that there was this all this language around agile, around sprints, around minimum viable products, uh, uh, around showcasing. All this language, which initially for me, I have to say, gave me an allergic reaction. Uh, it all sounded a lot like a lot of buzzword bingo. Um, and it took me a while, and it might just be that I, I ended up drinking too much Kool-Aid. I'm not sure. Um, but it took me a while to actually start to really understand some of the concepts uh, that were drawn from the digital world, drawn from IT and digital but were really of much broader general application. Um, and in particular, um, uh, well, I'll, I'll, I thought I'd be useful to step through what some of these agile concepts were uh, uh, to then explain why this mindset shift for me was so significant. And so um, uh, one really important part around an agile mindset, and by agile, um, I should say at the, at the outset, I don't mean agile uh, the adjective or adverb i mean the noun <laughs> and what do i mean by that uh, i don't mean uh, jumping nimbly from rock to rock to cross a stream uh, what i mean is agile the set of methods uh, principles and methods and disciplines um, drawn initially from uh, the digital side of, um, of the digital disciplines but of potentially of more general application and a really important first part of, of, of having an agile mindset 
is this idea of human-centered design. Um, and uh, we've all been used to, particularly in, in um, the development or problems, development of solutions or problem solving for public benefit, uh, to having either senior people or ministers say that the problem is this, uh, the solution is that, make it so. In other words, actually dictating what the problem is and what the solution is and just asking it for it to be implemented. And the really thing for me about Agile and particularly this element of human-centred design was this idea that actually you wouldn't do that. You wouldn't come up with a solution until you'd really, really deeply understood the problem. Uh, and that one of the key ways that you would approach that would actually be through the development of empathy, uh, which was a really uh, startling concept initially for me uh, as, a, as, a, as a traditional public policy wonk uh, and, and serious economist, um, to actually engage with the idea that instead, what you might do is go out and develop empathy with the people who are affected by the policy or the program or the regulatory regime that you're trying to implement. And that that empathy would be something you would gain by going and being in their space and actually understanding what life was like for them uh, and the other things that were happening in their life when they were having to engage uh, with the policy or the program or the um, activity that you were responsible for. Uh, and uh, this, this led me down a path of um, starting to realise that, in fact, I had something missing in my arsenal, um, that this idea around um, particularly this human-centred design approach that's a sort of key element of Agile was something that uh, I had a blind spot on. Um, similarly, another thing I had a blind spot on was some of the other concepts in Agile which relate to the idea of um, what, what's referred to as sprints and minimum viable products. Um, and I might just focus on the minimum viable product first. Um, I'd been very used to, and indeed the training that we received, um, both formal and then informal on the job training as, as public policy folks, uh, was it really had a strong emphasis on uh, uh, seeing a small problem, but then wanting it to be an ex a part of something much bigger. Um, the idea of solving a small problem was kind of not very exciting. So, uh, so we might have a part of our stakeholders saying, we've got this issue with this specific thing. The natural tendency of us for us would be to turn that into some much bigger problem that needed to be solved and then coming up with an enormous strategy for solving it. Um, and the agile mindset kind of turns that on its head and actually says, well, just think about what it is that the user, the person affected by your policy or program or uh, regulatory activity actually, uh, actually is asking you, is actually needing. Uh, and then rather than assuming you need an enormous strategy that will probably drown under its own weight uh, to solve it, just solve for that. Um, and that was quite a challenging thing for me as, uh, as a public policy person because it sort of meant, well, maybe my desire to have a great big strategy that I would wheel out for a minister uh, wasn't the right way of going about things. The idea then was this idea of a minimum viable product. So just to reflect very briefly on that, um, uh, the metaphor that's often used is one of a car, uh, that you have a user, uh, uh, a person who's affected, if you like, but a user who says, I need a car. I need to get from A to B and I need a car. Uh, and you say, well, okay, well, we could build you a car, but the problem with building you a car at one level will be that will take a long time and we won't have anything until you have the car. So in other words, in the first week, we might build the wheels. The next week, we might build the chassis. Uh, the week after that, we might build the windows uh, and then the seats and then the electrics. And you won't have anything until you get to last week. 
uh, where you put the whole car together. And the idea with, with, with an agile approach and thinking about a minimum viable product was to say, well, maybe we could deliver something of value to you much faster than that. Uh, so the metaphor that's often used is to say, okay, well, let's build you a skateboard. Let's come back to the user in a week with a skateboard and let the user try that. Uh, and so let's say, for example, the user says, well, okay, uh, that skateboard's all well and good, but it's a bit hard to steer. So could you give me some way of steering um, uh, to get from the state skateboard from A to B? And, and then uh, you go away for a week, you deliver something with handles so they can steer. And then they say, hmm, yeah, that's all well and good, but actually, uh, I need something that goes a bit faster. Uh, so, okay, well, well, we'll put a little engine on it. And so a week later, you come back with an engine, steering wheel, uh, handlebars, and, uh, uh, and a skateboard. And then they say, ah, well, that's exactly what I needed. I didn't actually need the car. And the idea then is you, this idea of a minimum viable product is that come back really quickly with something of value to the user, test to see whether that delivers a sufficient value, iterate from there, add further usability if you like. Uh, but a couple of things happen. You're testing early whether you're on the right track. So you don't end up going all the way to the finished product, i.e. the car, before you discover that it actually wasn't really what they were after. But secondly, you save a lot of money and time if you discover that in fact they didn't need the car in the first place. That in fact all they needed was the skateboard with, with uh, handlebars and, and an engine. So this idea of the minimum viable product along with the human-centered design um, are a couple of the key principles um, that I take from having an agile mindset uh, that lead you then to an understanding that you might otherwise be in a world where you're wanting things to be too all-encompassing, uh, too before you'll test it uh, with users. Uh, and that really led to me really rethinking quite a lot of the way in which I'd go on about doing my work uh, in terms of public policy. The kinds of things that that can then lead to, of course, though, is quite challenging from a cultural perspective. And so I might just spend a couple of minutes talking about that, which is part of the whole agile mindset is that you get a, a, a multidisciplinary team together that will cover the different ingredients that you, that you need uh, in order to uh, quickly work out with users uh, what's the real problem, then move to uh, uh, exploring really quickly, delivering value early, so a minimum viable product, and then iterating with the users. But one of the really challenging things about that is it's not, the, not what you might otherwise be familiar with, which is having someone from on high dictate what the problem is, what the solution is, and then telling you to go and make it happen. Uh, and that can be quite um, challenging from a cultural perspective within organisations, certainly been challenging in organisations I've been in, where people are used to and senior leaders are used to uh, just uh, issuing instructions about what should happen rather than devolving responsibility to the to the um, the team that's actually working directly with users and coming up with and then testing with users and iterating and continuing to improve um, a, 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 an approach. Uh, it can also be quite challenging for, for um, middle management because middle management won't be used to, not just to users, but in other words, uh, you don't want to go away and completely work up something to a finished standard, if you like, polished within an inch of its life before showing um, a, a senior stakeholder. The idea is that you'll show it early too, uh, uh, within you know a, a week sprint, as, as it's referred to, or two weeks. Show some early evidence of what you've been discovering uh, and, and what you think, your hypothesis about what you think the solution is. Uh, 
uh, seeking some feedback and then saying what's going to happen in the next sprint or two weeks or whatever, however you choose to box up the time. Uh, and that can be quite challenging for middle management who, who might feel as though, well, if we show something that's not um, uh, well developed and polished up the line, um, uh, that might not be acceptable. That might be a really risky strategy. And the different in, difference in mindset here, it needs to be, no, no, it's lower risk it's actually lower risk to show things early and often and iterate because you don't get towards the end of a project's life, for example, where you've used up all the resources and all the time before you show it uh, to users or you show it to uh, senior people. But it can be quite challenging from a cultural perspective. You can get a sense of them, that then that that leads to a, a model where uh, you really do need to empower people uh, to work in this way uh, with this, uh, this idea of moving as really early to really deeply understand the problem, allowing people to directly engage with, the, with users, people affected by the policy or the program or the, um, uh, the activity that you're engaged with. Um, uh, allow them to test with users really early, the early ideas or prototypes, uh, and then continuing to iterate. Um, uh, so it, it, there's a mixture of process and culture involved in that, um, but it becomes quite liberating and quite exciting uh, if you can land that uh, because people feel a much more greater sense of um, ownership and control over what they're doing. They feel particularly in large, and it might be different in Geoscience Australia, but particularly in large bureaucratic structures like government departments, they can feel liberated from the sort of stifling layers of bureaucracy that sit above them um, and also get a sense of actual, actually much faster moving to outcomes um, uh, and less likely to be in a world where they lose the will to live because of endless cycles of drafts uh, with senior folk before uh, something is allowed to be then tested uh, with, with, with users. So, um, this really changed my whole life, actually. It led to me thinking, well, actually, I feel quite disconnected from um, those that I'm, I'm, I'm meant to serve. Uh, it led to me uh, feeling as though I wanted to turn upside down a lot of the, the ways, uh, the structures in which I was operating and the ways in which um, I'd worked in the past. Uh, and it, it uh, of course, uh, because it was a bit of an epiphany or a road to Damascus conversion, it then le led me to be a bit of a crazy zealot, um, which I tried to do with humour, because um, no one likes a zealot with, without a sense of humour. Um, but it led me to start to think about ways in which the different environments I was operating in could also be turned on their heads. And where, where this had come from, um, uh, the Kool-Aid I'd drunk in relation to digital, Actually, I could see that these rhythms and these methods, these ways of working, were actually directly applicable uh, to many other forms of problem solving, many other forms of organising of teams, um, and in particular uh, also um, uh, the ways in which you would fit more closely and directly engage with um, those you serve in order to problem solve. Um, so it's been, been quite a, a, a change for me. Uh, I first then got the opportunity to work on that in the industry department and we worked a lot on that in relation to the service delivery that we were doing there and reforming that. Um, then an opportunity to do that at Austrade uh, and um, let, let us down a path of really trying to transform the service delivery offering there. And now here I am at agriculture. Um, and in each of those contexts, the obvious point to make is uh, the hardest part is not the technical kind of understanding of the different ways of working or taking having an agile mindset. It's actually the cultural change that's really the hardest. And persuading, uh, encouraging um, uh, the ideas and the take up of those ideas by other people. Uh, I'm actually more than happy to talk a bit about some of that uh, and some of the leadership challenges and uh, what sorts of things will encourage people 
uh, to adopt these different approaches and believe in them. Uh, but, I, but I'm also curious to understand more uh, some of the things that you, you might be curious about yourselves in terms of some of this language, these ideas, how it might be applicable in your context. So perhaps I'll pause there. I'm mindful of the time. Um, and maybe we can enter into a bit more of uh, Q&A at this point. Uh, so Steve, I might hand back to you. Terrific. Okay, thanks for that. That was that was good. I feel like it was the starting point of a journey, but we have had some great comments and a, a question that I'd like to put to you from the audience, if I may. Sure. Um, firstly, I'll just say the comments have been, yeah, it sounds like there's been a lot of pennies drop and people go, thanks for reminding me of that. That's That's been... Um, that's been interesting. But um, Joe Kakuza has a question, and it's a, it's a really interesting one. He's, he says, I'm not sure that building a car is quite the same as developing government policy. Developing something of value now may have negative outcomes in the long term. So the question is, to what extent does public policy development seriously look at implications in the long term Ollie Nielsen has then followed on with that and said, yeah, good question, Joe. Let's ask David how exactly one can develop public policy iteratively. So would you like to yeah. Yeah, share with us some yeah. thoughts on that? Good, good, good questions, good questions. Um, and of course, um, uh, the strength of a metaphor is it makes something very complex simple. Uh, and that's, of course, the weakness of a metaphor. <laughs> uh, so um, look, what I would say about that is uh, that um, it's of course important to be thinking about the, the long term as well. Um, and it does depend a bit on the nature of the public policy problem that you're trying to solve. Um, and uh, I suppose in more recent times for me, I've been particularly interested in those aspects of public policy and delivery that go to the direct impact on people and the ways in which um, uh, those in darkened rooms or windowless offices in Canberra can often be working on public policy problems kind of disconnected from reality and making all sorts of assumptions about the ways in which people will respond uh, to the public policy response uh, that you might have. Uh, that's seeking, um, in effect, a kind of a behavioural response. So that might be um, uh, in the um, uh, in the economic uh, sphere. It might be that you're seeking to influence sperm behaviour uh, or consumer behaviour in an economic sense, or it could be in social uh, social sphere in trying to um, influence um, health behaviours or caring responsibility behaviours or whatever trying to change a system in which the key actors in the system are, of course, the people that are in it. So it's a really good point to um, say that you also need to take a kind of systems thinking approach to the longer term implications of things. Perhaps my particular focus is on really deeply understanding what will lead to the kinds of behaviours that will have the, um, the kind of um, uh, economic or social outcomes that you're looking to achieve. And my hypothesis, or not my hypothesis, my thesis now <laughs> is that um, uh, in general, not always, but most commonly it's the case that the public, public policy work that we do is kind of done in a bubble or even just in a window. Um, and it is disconnected from really deep understanding of why people are behaving or doing the things that they do, the, the problems that they have that need to be solved. Um, we often have a tendency, for example, and I certainly did, uh, to give primacy to uh, statistical analysis of uh, um, the impact of certain kinds of interventions. Uh, and, and, and my training was that unless you had a good evidence base for doing something, you'd never do it. Um, uh, and the evidence base should be built on, you know, statistically valid samples of um, uh, of the uh, of the population or of the behaviours or of the economic activity you are seeking to influence. 
uh, and then say, and being able to test whether those those things uh, that you're wanting to intervene with uh, have, have the difference that you uh, anticipate. The thing that I really discovered is this idea that the thing that's missing from that is the human-centered design aspect, the really deep understanding uh, which you don't get through doing a survey or through economic analysis or statistical analysis of what's going on in people's heads uh, and why they're behaving the way that they are um, or uh, why they make the choices that they do. Um, and the best way of describing it that I, I've, I've, I've come across is really this idea that you're wanting to sit across the table from someone in their context uh, to watch what they do rather than just ask them what they do. In other words, understand what's happening when they're making the choices, the kind of decision-making processes they're going through, the context in which they're making those decisions. You can't get any of those by doing um, a lot of the traditional approaches, even focus groups. You can't get it from focus groups either because it's in an artificial environment uh, in which people are being asked questions rather than having what they do kind of observed. So I could ramble endlessly on this and I won't, um, but I, I, I guess I, my key point then is, yes, longer term implications are really important. But this agile stuff, and in particular, the human centered design part of agile is really directly going to, uh, why is it that people are doing the things that they're doing and how much you um, better design uh, for the impact or supporting the outcomes that you want for the benefit of them. Hit me with another question, Steve. <laughs> okay, um, that's great. There have been other questions come in. So we've got one here. They can from... be as provocative as you like, Steve. I'm okay. quite a provocative question. Yep. Um, we've got one here from Jeffrey Fraser, and he'd like to hear more of your views about whether you feel this focus on agile and rapid delivery can also be balanced with longer term work that progresses in parallel with the rapid turnaround work? Yes, of course. Um, so thanks, Jeffrey. Really good question. Um, uh, from my perspective, this is my, my epiphany was more a sense of inadequacy uh, around the tools I had in my toolkit. And it wasn't that I was going to throw all of the other tools out, uh, including longer term, uh, longer term thinking, longer term research, uh, longer term development of ideas. Uh, it was more that I had something missing that was partly around this, as I say, this deep empathy and, and understanding of uh, around these ideas of human centered design, and partly about the idea of rapid delivery. Um, and, and I suppose what I would be wary of um, is confusing the two things. So what do I mean by that? Um, uh, it is very common. I have had a lot of pushback um, around things where people are saying, no, no, we need to think about that for longer before we engage the people who are actually affected by it. <laughs> um, and so there's this inherent tension sometimes uh, around, no, no, we need to get this right before we reveal it or test it, rather than saying, let's take a bit of a risk, be humble about what we're, pre we're presenting to people, um, but say, look, we've been doing some initial thinking about this. Can we test some of these ideas with you really early, embarrassingly early? Uh, some people then say, um, oh, well, ministers won't cope with that or senior people won't cope with that because it's too risky. You know, we're going to go out there with half thought out, you know, turkey brained ideas um, and people will think we're fools um, uh, or it will get bad publicity or whatever. Um, I have to say, in my experience, um, manage the right way. That is not the reaction of senior folk um, and pardon me, including ministers, particularly if they can say, no, 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 that's just my peeps doing some good work. They're just coming up with some interesting ideas and they're doing, doing so in a way that we engage early and test with people whether they think there's anything in them. There's no, there's, you know, this is not government policy. This is just 
people doing what they should be doing, which is coming up with interesting ideas and testing them. And if some of them are duds, great. We'll find that out early rather than going 18 months into something, wheeling something out to the general public uh, and having particular stakeholders go, what have you he's been doing? You've come up with a bunch of stuff that is stupid. And if you'd asked us earlier, we could have told you that. It's also not the same as consultation. So consultation has its place. But in general, with consultation, of course, you've already decided. You've already come up with the thing, whatever the thing is. And you're showing it to people saying, we've come up with this thing. We basically decided the minister thinks it's awesome. What do you guys reckon? It's too late, right? People are already gathered around the new idea. Uh, and basically, the whole point is it hasn't been allowed out into public uh, into the into public viewing until people. Yeah, that's it. You got it. You've nailed it. Uh, all right, I'm going to pause again because I'll keep rambling otherwise. No, that's great. And, and I think, you know, the phrase that I think I heard you use earlier around this was don't be afraid to fail fast. So, yeah, good points. Yeah. Got another question from Trevor Dew. Trevor's also, I guess, coming from, you know, being within government, asking, hey, David, in driving cultural change towards these agile approaches, how have you dealt with systemic challenges in the public service? Brackets yeah. from our reporting, budget cycles, things like that. Yeah, really good question. There's a lot to unpack in all of that. Um, so, uh, what I've tended to do so uh, is with any kind of cultural change or system change like this, uh, if you stand back from it far enough, there's two broad approaches you can take. One is to experiment with little things that don't matter and try and prove it up from there. Uh, in other words, what you then consider to be low risk but experiment with ways of which, for example, budget cycles or procurement processes or recruitment or um, um, strategic planning approaches, uh, et cetera, ways in which you can play around with them, but on something small. But if it goes wrong, it doesn't matter. That's one path. However, it's not the path that I support. <laughs> so the path that I is doing it on something that some bastard cares about. Uh, in other words, actually, it might sound higher risk, and I suppose at one level it is, but my approach has tended to be uh, pick things that are core to your organisation's uh, success uh, and use uh, those opportunities, and you might only pick one, <laughs> um, as a way of demonstrating and practicing on something big. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is the big things that are critical to success, someone cares about and therefore it'll be a priority and you'll be able to properly resource it. But the most important reason for doing that is it will actually prove something. Doing something on make work nonsense that are low, that's low risk doesn't prove anything. It doesn't actually persuade senior people or the people who control some of the other things you've got to interface with like budgets um, it doesn't persuade them that this is a good way of working because they just say well that's just the funksters you know the skivvy wearing types playing with the fairies at the bottom of the garden um, that's not us serious characters who solve the big problems for the organization so from my perspective and i know it might sound a bit counterintuitive I've tended to take what might be perceived to be a higher risk approach, which is to go for bigger things and prove it up on a big thing. Um, and you get more engagement at a senior level that way because it's something that someone cares about. Um, you get better resourced. Uh, it can be higher risk, but I think you've probably picked up that I don't think this approach is higher risk. In fact, I think it's lower risk because you're testing things early and often rather than building the whole thing and then wheeling it out and then people going, oh, that's a bit weird. So 
that's been my approach and it continues to be my approach when i set up the uh, set up an innovation lab in the industry department called the biz lab which i'm not sure if it's still alive but it'll, it it lived for about four or five years which i thought wasn't a bad achievement for these sort of things it wasn't allowed to work on anything uh, that uh, someone senior didn't care about uh, so there was no frippery no kind of I used to refer to it as there should be no tinsel around here. Um, you can't have projects that, you know, no one cares about uh, if you think you're going to try and change stuff the way people work. David, thank you. We've got lots of questions coming in. I don't think we're going to get through all of them. Um, so I'll cherry pick a little bit. Um, and uh, one here from James Johnson. Hi, David. Great talk. Hi, James. Thank you. Uh, how would you take agile methods to solving policy issues of the Murray-Darling Basin? There you go, Dave. Solve, solve. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that, that's a very, very big, uh, a very big question. I suppose what I would say about that um, is what we would tend to do with policy problem like that is to do a lot of economic analysis. Uh, we would do a lot of modeling. Um, we would have a lot of economic theory applied to things. Uh, and then we would go out and do community engagement that would take by and large uh, the form of town halls. Uh, and we'd put out papers and invite people to comment on them. Uh, that would be generally speaking what we would do. Um, an agile or a human-centered design approach to, the, to solving a problem like that would be to actually go out and spend quite a lot of time one-on-one -on -one with various actors operating in that system and spending quite a lot of time, as I said earlier, developing this curious concept of empathy uh, with, uh, with those different actors in the system. Uh, and pretty early then going back and testing with them, is this, is this right? Is this the problem that you're facing? Um, now, I can't say that no one will have done that before for something as fraught and as long-term as the Murray Town Basin. But I suppose what I would say is very often our approach to engagement or consultation or trying to understand the needs of stakeholders is to talk to the people who research the people or talk to the people that represent the people but not the people and oftentimes what we, people will be nervous about is if you do that form of engagement that form of research you won't end up with if you like representative samples uh, of that population and you'll be basing coming to conclusions that might be drawn on what people might perceive to then be in effect collections of anecdotes from the stories that you hear from the lives of the people who you're engaging with in that kind of way and i suppose that takes me back to saying um in in approaching a problem like that i'm not suggesting you only do one thing or that you throw out all the other ways of thinking about a public policy problem i'm saying add this because if you add this approach i am quite certain that what you end up with is something extra that can help inform um, better decision making you would also then have an approach which um, says um, instead of having taken all of that information in you disappear to a darkened room for two years or whatever the period of time is develop the whole thing up and then wheel it out instead what you would do is come up with bits of solutions early and go out and test them and not be scared to do that be mindful that you'll get different reactions but have the whole thing conditioned about uh, we're not going to disappear and come back with a green paper uh, or a white paper or whatever. We're going to be testing with people ideas early and often. 
and that would be quite a different approach to solving something as gnarly as the Murray-Darling Basin. I don't know. Who knows whether it would work? You might still end up with the entrenched positions uh, born out of self-interest, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, on a public policy problem like that. Those things won't go away just because you use this different approach. David, I have to say, you've done a great job of stimulating lots of questions and I'm not going to be able to get all of them to you because although my job is to help facilitate this discussion, it's also my job is to finish on time. And yep. so um, I'm, I am going to wrap it up there, but I will just flag with you just so you know that great questions from people like Emma Johnson about you know, asking more information about strategies that you've used to overcome um, some of the resistance to implementation. Richard Blewett yep. asking about you know, how this can affect perhaps NPPs and um, allowing yep. them that little bit more flexibility and scalability along the lines of what you've talked about. But I'm sorry, we, we don't have time to to expand on those. I I, I wonder if, if you would be happy if you were really contacted by perhaps some of those people or... Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that's great. Because I think... I'm happy to do a follow-up session. I, with I was even wondering that. I would like to do that. I'm very but, happy to do that because it's I'm conscious that it raises lots of questions. A and that, the reality yeah. is no one's got all the answers. <laughs> Uh, I, I'm experimenting as I go as well. And the, the most important thing about this whole stuff, particularly because it's so it's so at risk of being accused of being buzzword bingo and just rebranding a whole lot of thinking that's been around forever, is uh, is to be bringing these forward these ideas forward with uh, humility uh, and good humour. Uh, so I generally like to take the piss out of myself as much as possible. Um, uh, because it's much better to be a humorous sellot than, than a, uh, sorry, a humour-filled zealot than a humourless zealot. Um, so uh, that, thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today. I'm, that's I'm, great. And thank you so much for making the time. Um, we will put a bit of pressure on you for a follow-up because at that suggestion, there's been a flood of comments come in saying, yeah, let's have a follow-up. So let's see how we go with that one. Um, uh, that's fine. But yeah, let me just finish then by saying thank you very much. Thanks for your time. I also would like to promote our next week's seminar, which also looks like it's going to be a really interesting one. That's by a couple of our Geoscience Australia scientists uh, in um, Inanda Ray and Chris Harris-Pascal. And they're talking about extending groundwater salinity estimation using borehole and airborne electromagnetic data. Maybe we could ask them wow. about the Murray Basin as well. <laughs> so, yeah, but no, that terrific cool. stuff. Thank you very much, David, and I'm sure everyone really got a lot out of that. And as I said, they're asking for more. So no worries. thank you. Have All a right. good day, everybody. Have a great day. Bye-bye.